it starts coming back together. So everybody in you can finish up your conversation or your sentence, whatever. Um, and make sure that when you leave Google Hangouts and go to Zoom, that you can remind me. Okay. And then, um, victorious up until this point. However, I think that I've pinned down a, a couple of uh, ways to explain this concept. When we, we get something like thinking and concepts, our first way when we're going to we think about analyzing it is how do we define it? We look up on the, the internet or someplace, we need a definition of it. And then we need examples. And this, unfortunately, is the way that a lot of academia, including from all the way down into to grade school, is the way that we are taught to think about things. It's discrete knowledge and definitions. And when you're dealing with just the definitions, you're missing the concept. You're missing the essence. So when we, we look then how to analyze this concept, what's the first thing that we, we need to do? Well, first, I think that that formulation, I'd be interested, I'd be interested in seeing what the Russian is. Because is, if you think about thinking in concepts, and then thinking with concepts. That little preposition changes things pretty dramatically. And when we then we're thinking with concepts as opposed to in concepts. And so 
this is a, a formulation that I think is, is clearer. So we're going to look at this in the species first, and we're not going to go all the way back to one I carry for this particular one, even, even though I, I hear that she was pretty wild in her teenage years. And so we'll look at the process. That's one of the things that when any concept we're looking at, we need to always put in the front of our thinking process. Because we tend to look at products. And if you look at manifestations, in doing that, we don't get to the essence because the essence is in the whole process of development of something. And so, and in looking at any process, any process comes into being. We then need to look at how it comes into being. So, how did thinking with concepts come into to being? And it's always important when we, we look at any concept to think about what came right before. We, we tend to start with the concept and don't look at what was right before it. And so looking at this and what came right before thinking in concepts. It's, whenever there's this dialectical transformation, it's always very illuminating because you're looking at, you're gaining a deeper understanding of whatever uh, manifestation is going out of existence and which one is coming in to existence. So Marx, when he was talking about the bourgeois revolution, said that we, by studying that revolution, we both gain a deeper understanding of feudalism and a monarchy, and we get a better understanding of the whatever it is that's coming into existence. And so that, that holds true for any concept that we're, we're looking at. So as with Vygotsky, we'll look at the, the species and then look at the individual. And with the individual, We've studied the what came before when we looked at thinking with complexes. And something that I just, um, in my, my reading and research for this presentation, came across something quite interesting, and that's on the anatomic development in the teenage brain. We tend to think of the raging hormones as defining the teenage years, but they do play a role, but it's actually a relatively insignificant role in terms of the uh, adolescent's whole development and what's going on anatomically. There's three different things that are happening. One is myelination, and we'll, I'll go into that a little bit, but what it means is that that energy is more efficiently get um, transferred through the, the neuron, the axon of the neuron. The other is increased dopamine. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter. We'll go into that a little bit. And a, con a concept that was really quite interesting for me was the concept of syn synaptic pruning. We think about that when we, a child, Every child is born with the capacity to understand and process every sound in the human language. But if the sounds aren't in that language, then that, that the neuronal connection for that sound gets, gets pruned because it's not being used. And the brain is all about efficiency. And so we'll we'll look at the kind of this synaptic pruning that takes place with the teenagers. So with myelination, this is one, <clears throat> one, one nerve cell, and you can see all the, the dendrites, and then there's this, sh this sheath. 
that's the, the axon, and you'll you see the little yellow, and that's the myelination. And this, this gives a, a bigger picture, almost looks like when I carried it there. Yes. And in this picture, in the two circles, the first one is looking at a synapse. And the synapse is, operates by chemicals, different chemicals that are released. And those chemicals then are responsible for taking the message further along the neuronal network. And that's where dopamine comes in. Dopamine is a, is a neuronal is a neurotransmitter, and so it helps with the trans transfer of, of information. And the second window or circle is for the actual myelination. And what it is is there's this something called glial cells that are a big portion of, the, of what's in the cranium. And they wrap around, it's almost like a fatty tissue, they wrap around the axon and but it's like insulation for a wire. So with the brain from the very, very beginning, from what I care, speed is always very, very important. Because speed and efficiency, if you don't have them, you're going to die. And so this helps the, the speed with which messages can go through the the neuronal network in the brain. And this is a, an important change that, that takes place. And the reason that it's important is that the development of the cognitive structures for teenagers, a lot of it has to do with the prefrontal cortex, which is used for reasoning and planning and abstraction. And both the myelination and the dopamine during the anatomical changes in the teenage brain mean that more information can come up into the prefrontal cortex and be processed. And then this gives you a little picture of the, the neurons. Um, I mentioned the, the dopamine and the, the serotonin. And serotonin, you can see down in the, the bottom that it's uh, mood, memory, processing, sleep, and cognition. And that's one of the things with teenagers. Um, uh, if you remember back to when it became increasingly hard to get out of bed and make the 740 bell at high school. And it, one of the things that is changing is the sleeping patterns of teenagers. And they're actually doing experimenting starting high school later, like 10 o'clock, and they're getting a lot better results. The one issue that comes up is athletics, because it pushes those sort of things to the evening. And as we know, athletics rules, right? And so the Dopamine, you can see in blue there that most of the dopamine pathways that are reinforced are going up to the, the pre <coughs> prefrontal cortex there in, in gray. And so this is an, an important anatomical change. And all of these things play a role in the qualitative transformation that takes place during adolescence or transitional ages that that's what talks about. One of the things he mentioned quite a bit is this whole question of, of perception and memory. And if we think about the objective world out there, what's happening is that there's energy, there's information in patterns, in energy that's coming in, and those, those that energy is law governed. And so, and that's what science is all about, is trying to discover the laws of motion 
behind the matter. And so that comes in, but we do not, there, there is not color out in the world. What is coming in is electromagnetic radiation in the form of light waves. Color does not exist in those light waves. What happens is it hits a, a, a cell on the retina, and there's like 130 million cells that receive light waves. And when certain light waves are coming in, the frequency, it builds up these nerve cells. So we are actually constructing the ability to see colors. And it's a, it's a pretty difficult thing to wrap our head around to say that, well, I can see that that shirt over there is red, but the shirt isn't red. The light waves that are coming into my retina are transducing it, and that's what we'll get into here next, into redness. And so that sensing takes place in our, you know, the five senses. And again, it's information, either chemical or electrical, information that's coming in. But as it comes in, it's always changed. The sound waves don't go into our brain. The light waves don't go into our brain. The actual touch doesn't, the taste doesn't. This is coming. Those all are sensed and then transduced, changed into the energy, the language of the brain. And so that's an important concept. And we tend to think about, and I think in one of the videos, I. I showed how my thinking had evolved on sensation and perception. We tend to use those two interchangeably, but they're fundamentally different. The sensing and then what we do with that information is the perceiving. So perception doesn't take place at the point of input at the sense organ. Perception takes place and is a creation of mental brain processes. And with that perceiving, we create a, a reality. And then we judge whether this feels good or feels bad. And we looked at this last week on the affective process. And it's important here to look at, <coughs> there's two realities on the screen right now. All right? There's the reality of the phenomenon that we create by observing the doggy. And then there's the reality which is that doggy. And that reality is the reality that we, we talked about it at the very beginning. That it's that reality is matter in motion with energy behind that motion. And that's reality. That's all of reality, from the Big Bang to the, the, the quarks. And so that reality exists. And what tends to happen is that we confuse the reality as it exists out there and the reality that we are creating in our own world. So it's a big distinction, and this really gets to the essence of epistemological approaches, just looking at observable and ontological, looking at the being of something. There's the, the objective world exists, and that existence can be examined only by looking at it ontologically, looking at it as a a process. So based on our judging and feeling, it leads to activity. And activity is, again, expending energy. It's both 
internal and external so that when we get information in that energy is it, it's expelled in our motion in our activity but that energy also goes to our the brain mind and is processed into from into our body so that if there's fear then it's a release of the endorphins, I guess. It opens up the, the capillaries of the blood flow so that you can run, and et cetera. So these anatomical changes take place because of the way that we emotionally experience information energy coming in. And all of this is thinking. And it's important when we think of thinking to look at the totality. Because we tend to sort of think of thinking as in a box of our most, you know, this I'm in my head thinking. And thinking is this whole process. And it's important to keep that in mind when we talk about thinking with concepts. And then memory plays a big role. I'll, I'll talk a bit about memory. A little bit. But he talked about visual perception, and so we've got the light waves coming into the retina, and you can see them going back to the visual cortex. And one important thing about vision is very little of the light waves that are actually coming in are fully processed back to the visual cortex that's inefficient and instead what happens is the anticipatory priming we talked about last week where the neuronal network begins already to push up the interpretation understanding of the light waves so that then you can act a lot quicker we don't really so it's a question too of you know how much do we we see, and Betty and I were talking about see on the way over. It's an interesting concept, what do we mean by see? Is it the light waves, is it processing, the whole visual percept, sensation, percept, <laughs> gets put down into this simple little word, see. What we actually see in terms of the amount of information that we are actually fully processing in our visual cortex is about the size of a coin if you hold it at arm's length. So you can, it's a very small. That's what we're actually seeing. The rest is being filled in by anticipatory priming and the brain concern. We can't cross that huge information, nor do we need to. If we're st staring, if you're staring some someplace and there's a little motion over to the side, our, our attention is, is directed right to that because it doesn't fit in with our anticipatory priming. And that's the way animals survive, is if there's, there's the anticipatory priming, but if there's an error in that, you've got to attend to it and see what it is, because that's, you know, you know then whether to flee or fight. <clears throat> this is a quote from, from Vygotsky on the seeing. So I'll let you, I'll let you read that. This is one of those ones that you sort of puzzle over. It sort of makes sense, and you sort of think, you know, what he's he's talking about. But he's talking about what we were just talking about. <clears throat> and if we look at these 
cabinet, table, and person. This is the, the word, the meaning that's captured in each one of those three is a concept. We do not see concepts. We see forms, shape. And then the brain processes it. So the, the seeing is really, there's these two separate seeing. One is the actual information that's coming in. But then there's what we, how we construct. We construct using language, using concepts. We construct the world around it. We exist, but we construct our reality of that world. And so that's where he, that seeing, that perceiving, he's right here pointing out the fundamental difference between sensation and perception. Sensation is a form, etc. The perception is what we do with using language. So memory. How does memory work? Are you thinking about it? Are you going into your memory and trying to find out how memory works? We tend to use a computer model for it, that memory is stored, that information experiences come in, and then we store them. And then when we, we want to go, we then go back and pull that stored memory off of the film shelf in the back of our head. <coughs> Nowhere close to how it works. But that's sort of standard wisdom. There's a, a book, The Forgetting Machine, and I don't, by uh, Rodrigo Quian Quiroga, who's a Brazilian neuroscientist. And it's, a, it's an extremely interesting book. It's a short one, and he, he has a brain, uh, kind of brain science podcast. It's quite good. And I don't know if you can read underneath the head there where it says memory, perception, and the Jennifer Aniston neuron, which is kind of an intriguing thought, isn't it? Hmm? So here's the a, a picture of the, the brain, and we're looking in particular here at the hippocampus, which is this piece that looks like a nice red chili pepper there. And, and it, it uh, and then you can see the amygdala is right, right next door. The hippocampus is a place that, where short memory short-term memory is stored and then it's processed <coughs> into the prefrontal cortex. The, in the hippocampus, there is a, a, a patient whose initials were HM. Sometimes I think it was me. Sometimes my short-term memory is not working. And, and he had epileptic seizures that were so bad that he couldn't function. So they went in and took out the hippocampus. This was about 50 years ago. And he had a good memory of things that occurred before the operation. But afterwards, you would meet him, and then five or 10 minutes later, you would have no memory of him. So there's all kinds of studies done on, on HM in the, the hippocampus. And so one of the things that Kiroka points out is the, the limits of brain imaging. There's a lot that we see in educational literature. Now, this is the reading circuit, and this is the memory circuit. And this is where fear is a circuit for fear. 
And the brain doesn't work like that. And what they are capturing on brain imaging is very <laughs> high up in the neuronal structure. So they're, they're getting the sort of gross approximation of what's really going on. But they're using those gross approximations to dictate how children should be taught to read. And so it's this, but it's research. Brain science has has shown has shown based on certain based on putting a child into a, a MRI machine, showing words, and then looking and seeing see what goes on inside the brain. <coughs> the next day, the same child with the same words goes in, and it's completely different because it's at a it's macro level. But that that's the field is enamored with brain imaging. And the problem is, is that you can't get deep enough in the brain to really register what's going on down at this neuronal level. And so what happened with Kiroka was that there is a group of epileptic patients and they had all had seizures that were, were and they couldn't be controlled with medication. So they were going to go in and, and cut out the offending piece of the hippocampus that was causing the the seizures, but they didn't want to take out too much, and they didn't want to leave in too much. And so with these electrodes planted deep in their hippocampus, they were able to register the neuronal level. Well, what Kiroga did was went, in, went into the hospital and took advantage of the depth of the imaging that was taking place. And based on that data then came developed the theory. And one of the things that I found very interesting and and Therese and some of the other Marco and other mathematicians can explain it in some time. Kiroga says that the data was always there. They always they always could see this data. But they couldn't they did not have the mathematics to figure out what that data is revealing. And so it's an interesting concept, this more than two plus two, which is a stretch for me. So then how does this all fit in with what we were talking about with the, the conceptual neuronal network? So what Kiroga did was take his computer and show just a whole bunch of different images and then see whether anything lit up. And with this one patient, he showed a picture of Jennifer Aniston. Those are all the ones up the, across the top of her. I guess the others are the red head or somebody, and then other images. But um, every time a picture of Jennifer Aniston came up, this neuron lit up. And it didn't matter you know what how old she was what, what hairstyle she was with every every single time it lit up then he put the name just written name and that neuron lit up and then he used a voice and that neuron lit, lit up and in that little piece of it you can see the the multimodal way of processing so that when we talk about the visual cortex, the neurons involved with the visual cortex are not just exclusively for visual, they also are part of a network that's bringing information in from the ears and, and <coughs> the, the eyes, right? And so what's happening here then is that this is a neuronal network that has been established in this particular person and it holds the concept of Jennifer Anderson. And then he did other patients and had 
had um, one with, with uh, Oprah Winfrey at the Eiffel Tower, and then a neuron lived up for Oprah Winfrey, and then he would show a picture of the Eiffel Tower, and the Oprah Winfrey neuron would light up. And so we talked about this when we, when we mentioned the very first words that humans had. It was at that point with meaning that they were creating concepts. And these concepts then became part of this whole conceptual system. And so what Kiroga found is that, yes, this is the way that our memory works and our mind works it's based on concepts. So when we remember something, it's not like that we go back and retrieve it. It's a, a creation. Every memory is a creation. We don't have a film back there that we can index. We every it's a creation, and the creation is through all of these interconnections in this neuronal network. So that, that lighting up then at the very basic level shows how we put together this conceptual neuronal network. And it's through these connections of these synapses. So there's 86 billion neurons in the human brain, 86 billion. And so you can just begin to think about the connections that are taking place. And then this was another thing that uh, Kiroga found. That's uh, Luke Skywalker and then Yoda and Darth Vader. And you can see where the arrows are showing that the Luke, Luke Walker <coughs> picture is lighting up the, that same, the, you can see where the concept is connected. And so, and the same with yoga, you can see those connections where the arrows are. And so when we get information in, that's what our brain is doing, is making all of these connections. And it's instantaneous. This you can just imagine this is a, a, a neuronal network. Now, each neuron can have up to 100,000 dendrites. And dendrites are connecting with other neurons. So just off the top of your head, Teresa, 86 billion times 100, <laughs> lots and lots, trillions. So there are trillions of connections in this neuronal network. And that's the complexity of the human brain. And so when we And one of the things like perception, with perception, we don't need very much visual information for us to create the whole picture. The same thing with memory. Just a little teeny piece of information can pull up a, a, a memory. And the thing with, with memory from the animal kingdom up to us is it's holistic. We take in, you take in the whole scene. You're not worried if a <coughs> attacker is coming at you, whether the third button on the shirt is, is buttoned or not. Or it's, you're taking in the whole scene and based on that, acting. And our memory is on the whole scene because we understand what's going on and need them to act. If you focus just on the details, lights out. 
But you think about how education uses memory. It's on the details. Memorizing discrete names, capitals of names of presidents, this discrete knowledge. And that's not the way the human brain was designed. It goes completely against it. And that's where you get this big divide between knowledge and understanding. Because the, the understanding is based on using the holistic memory brain process, as opposed to just discrete pieces of knowledge. And people can go through school regurgitating the definitions and the formulas and the equations, but not understand them because they don't understand how they fit into this conceptual, whole conceptual system. And that's why I, we, we should focus in on understanding and not just knowledge. And key to that understanding is meaning. And that's where Vygotsky's whole theory is, the, this meaning. And so thinking with concepts is what really builds our conceptual network. And then with meaningful languaging, and I'm not sure about that formulation. I'm still sort of working on it. I, you know, it's not languaging, meaning through la language use, or, but this is, it's really, this is human languaging. So with human languaging, we move from thinking based on appearances to thinking based on essences. And that's a huge challenge. Well, then how does this transformation take place in adolescence and homo sapiens? If this, where, where in human development of humanity was there this change from thinking on appearances and thinking on with concepts? And this is the a key piece. We use this sort of as a capturing every species needs a guide, a neural network to set up for them to survive. So before we look at the at complexes and concepts, let's look at the etymology. And I'll let you read through that first book. And then for our purposes, let's <clears throat> comprehend is a very important one. And the comprehend is <clears throat> weaving together. And you think about when Vygotsky talks about thinking with complexes, he's talking about weaving together the relationships that exist between objects in the world. Initially, it was just their subjective reaction to the Everything was subjective, so a word could be used anywhere based on their own subjectivity. But with thinking with complexes, it's making relationships that actually exist between objects or actions. And that's that bringing together. So when words are applied to these manifestations, that's when we're really talking about thinking with appearances. And we've underscored throughout the seminar, just on what Marx and Vygotsky talked about, that if essence and appearance were identical, there would be no need for science. What you see is what you get, kind of. And so a lot of science is based on appearances, and that's important. You've got to deal with that reality. But there's another side to it, to understand the laws behind it. And so 
and getting to the essence of whatever it is that you're looking at means looking at that which is not there. And that's one of the things with thinking with concepts. You're thinking about something that is not there. And so this thinking with appearances, I think, is a, another way to conceptualize thinking with uh, complexes. English translation turns it around and says complex of thinking, but that completely misses the, the point. So, read through what it says about concept. And for us, <coughs> this is some abstract generalization and this to take in and hold. It's from conceit, and it you know, also means to impregnate. But that's, you know, take in the seed and hold it there for pretty much. And then to grasp. And that's what we're doing with thinking with concepts, is taking in a concept and being able to hold on to that concept in your mind, in your brain mind, bring in another concept, and then think with those concepts, making comparisons, relationships. And so that's that <coughs> taking in and holding is a key piece. And so here, we're really looking at getting to the meaning of something and the understanding its essence, its whole process. And so thinking with essences, then, is, again, another way to think about thinking with concepts. So how do we get from within the species? We talked about the fixed visual field and how language helps to break humans from the fixed visual field. A number of turning points, the controlling fire, hunting big game, getting a lot of protein necessary for the neurons, which use up a lot of energy, building the frontal cortex. And then we've also stressed the social organization based on the bonobos of matriarchy. And we talked last time about the affective system. And so these are aspects of the place at which homo sapiens were before they took this leap. And we're going to really, uh, the Homo sapiens began around 300,000 300, years ago. And but we're really going to look at about 70. One thing that was, was fascinating, fascinating is the Homo sapiens population by by 70,000 years ago, was down to somewhere in the range of 10,000. You can imagine the whole species is half the size of the student body at, at UNM. And, and what happened? Well, some they worked it out somehow. <laughs> The, the key is the delaying the reproductive age from about 10 to 11 to 12 to 13. We'll go into that, you know, why that may be a different, how, what, <coughs> what, what that did. So really what it did was to, it created a time for what we would now look at it as the teenage brain to develop. And so my theory is that it was mostly the female teenagers who were responsible for the development of the brain because they were in a matriarchy and so they were Female women control the social organization and how that 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 group functioned, and 
delaying the reproductive age is, you know, obviously far more significant for females than it is for males. And so it was the females developing a teenage brain, and this is something that went on for thousands of years, but that is really the key to what makes us human beings. Without that development of the adolescent brain, humanity would not have survived or would not have been in this shape. So, and the females were a lot more in contact with how the how nature works in terms of the, the food production and agriculture and the cooking and they creating the pottery and the tools and and whatnot. And so they're a lot more creative. So if we look <coughs> at this at you know early human Homo sapiens about 70,000 years ago. First, there was childhood and then reproduction, and it went into adulthood. Once the children came, they began operating like the adult world before them had been operating, and that was without the benefit of the teenage brain. And with this delay, well, I'm going to use, we have a, a uh, my Maundi is from Cong Congo, where the bonobos are. And I picked one that's a more modern <coughs> picture, because in looking for the pictures, almost all of the pictures depicting early humans have been, the pavement has been enlightened considerably. And we're talking, you know, 70,000 years ago in the heart of Africa. And so, my own bee is going to be, and that word in Swahili means um, endurance and success. That is, due to my own bees developing her brain that we're sitting here. So endurance and success is important. By delaying the reproductive years, there was a creation of adolescence, time when the brain, particularly the female teenage brain, developed. And this was, again, over thousands of years. But what it means is, is that they're more creative, they're able to explore more, able to learn more, to understand more. One of the things that's interesting about the, the brain, I'll get into this with the synaptic pruning, is that the, the brain is actually, for modern humans, the brain is actually at its largest at the, around the age of 12. And so that period from 10 to 12, there's a, a huge development that then that gets pruned. And so we're going to use my own being as a present day uh, teenager. And that's with the 12 to 13 is the reproduction. But then, especially as a more modern society, that teenage period is extended to 17. So when a lot of the processes that have taken place in the change in the uh, anatomy of the brain reach their culmination. And it's really there where Vygotsky says that the true personality of an individual. And I'll explain why in a minute. So things that mark both the early and the, the, the present is risk taking. Adolescents take risks. And that's a good thing if you're qualified. Good thing if you're, when you're trying to understand the world, you've got to push it. You've got to go to the next level. And to do that, it means taking a risk. And whatever we're doing, whether it's in academic or sports or life, love, you take risks. 
and there's consequences. But you need to be able to weigh those, and adolescents are not necessarily the best at, at evaluating. Adolescents become curious. They want to know how the how the world works. And some of the greatest times of creativity are during adolescence. Some people are thinking that you know, some of the geniuses, the Einsteins, and have some of their insights early on in their teenage years, but they didn't have the broader understanding to capture the concept. But that creativity was there, and you see that in the poems and that. So what happens during this change in the brain is the development of abstraction, planning, conceptual understanding based on the meaning, getting to the essence of concepts, and understanding how things are all part of the interconnected system. This is what teenagers are about. This is what happens with the teenage brain. And it was because of this that then humanity was able to go and develop this huge concept conceptual understanding that we have now. And I might say that, you know, I'm sure that male teenagers back then sort of lagged behind the female. And it's really too bad that they didn't lag behind them for till the present day because the world would be a far better place to live in had that happened. So these things that we looked at, the myelination, the dopamine, and synaptic dopamine, were taking place during these developmental years of the teenage brain. That, that process didn't just start at some point. It was a long process, and it started right during this period of time. And so, so it's, it's key to develop with development of humanity. Is it? Yeah. Um, my screen is, is blocked. So we we think about this the mode of thinking. That's a pretty difficult one to again wrap. On. What do we mean by a mode of thinking? Oh, well, okay. So a way of thinking, so, a method of thinking. But none of those three help out at all. The mode of thinking is the, the entire complexity of what we've been talking about. That the thinking in with with complexes, the humanity developing meaning concepts, conceptual systems, that is the part of what we're talking about with thinking. And that mode of thinking depends on a neuronal network. That's huge to our thinking. That's what the, how thinking takes place, is this energy amongst the neuronal network. And so, the mode of thinking that changes with from the, the childhood is they have a structure, a neuronal structure that's based on thinking with complexes. But that neuronal structure is not good for thinking with concepts. There's a, a jump, yeah. a completely new, well not completely new, but a new neuronal network needs to be established for thinking with concepts. And so in adolescence, this mode of thinking shifts. Thinking with, with essences, we're looking at the concepts behind 
how things work in the natural, physical, cultural, social world. And so the neuronal structure that's needed needs to be replaced a neuronal structure before. And this was one of the great insights that I had This, I've read you know, the number is pretty common that neuroscientists talk about this synaptic pruning that's taking place, but they don't explain how, how and why. And if we take what Vygotsky was talking about with thinking with concepts and think about a neuronal system based on thinking with concepts, those neurons and connections that are needed for thinking with concepts are not needed <laughs> this new neuronal network. And so for the, the efficiency of the brain, those are pruned away. And so it's taking Vygotsky's thinking in neuroscience and coming up with an explanation. Because the synaptic pruning, it's not just getting rid of synapses that weren't used, it's getting rid of synapses that were used very much in childhood and thinking with complex. But it's not, they're not needed, and so they're pruned away. And this synaptic pruning it really, I think, illustrates one of the big issues with adolescence, and that is the pruning starts at the most basic level, which is where you imagine. And then it goes through the brain, you know, from here, it would be, you know, from, the, from the, the right to the, the left. It's in the prefrontal cortex is the last place that the pruning takes place. So what happens is that adolescents get these, this pruning that's taking place and maybe increasing their risk taking, but they don't yet have developed the judgment that comes from the prefrontal cortex to make wise choices about whether to that extra drink, or I don't know what's in this pill, but let's find out. And so the, those kinds of risks we see, and one of the things with the dopamine in the adolescent brain is it's a lot more susceptible to addiction because the, the judgment that can prevent the addiction has not yet developed. And so there's a strong addiction in, in adolescents, and that's why it's important that they, they put off while they're experimenting with things that they don't know about. So, like sex. So, <clears throat> this is, I think, a good example of how Vygotsky supplements neuroscience, this, this synaptic pruning. And just quickly, it, it's, it's interesting to look at how the concept of personality and worldview fit into the way we were looking at affect. In the same way, the concept of self really comes from others. It doesn't start with the the individual starts with the others, the family. And it's through awareness of others that then individuals become aware of self. And that's a key piece of what he means by personality, is this concept of self. And so that concept of self comes from others. There's that intersection and then the child takes on and begins developing that awareness of self. And this is really pronounced during adolescence. 
because a key piece of thinking with concepts is that you're able to create a concept of somebody else having a thinking process. They're very concerned about what somebody is thinking about them. And in thinking about other people thinking, they also begin thinking about themselves. And they become very introspective. And so there's this process of developing one's own identity, but it's also very much tied into a social belonging. The big thing they want to also do is to, in showing the independence, break from the, the parents. I was talking to my, my daughter and I, 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 that I um, mentioned that's going to be doing something on this and the, the trauma of the teenage years. And I was thinking about it in general and she was thinking about it with the trauma that she caused to me. And I, I told her that my synapses have been sufficiently proven that I don't have any remembrance of her, <laughs> her turbulent teenage years. Now there's this, so this is a, Vygotsky's saying this is key to understanding adolescence. I'll let you read that. And we run into words like personality and worldview. Worldview is a terrible translation of it. And I don't know what the, the Russian is, but it, it's a terrible translation. So, so <clears throat> I'll let you read this one too. This is an important clarification because we, you know, again, like we were talking last time, that adults ascribe emotions to dogs or football team. Or and so the, the here, the, the personality, we as, ascribe this to an infant. She has you know, her daddy's personality at four days old. And so he's not talking about those internal. He's talking about the social personality. And that starts with, in Europe, in terms of social cultural uh, effects on, in that physical, on the, the, the in utero development. And then at birth, there's, it's immediately within this context and that context and the social interaction those are the seeds of personality but the real personality Vygotsky sense doesn't come about until somebody understands their own thinking process and understands themselves as an entity and that then is a cornerstone for the concept of personality. And so that's why he says that the, the, you know, that's personality in development, but then it really starts to become um, what he's talking about, and that is his understanding of self in the, in the adolescent. And Anne raised, I think, again, on uh, abstract thinking and it's important to think about concepts like abstract thinking. Vygotsky says that adolescence, the, the, the child, the, the youth, is really beginning to use abstract thinking. And it's not that, that we've talked about chickens I mean, using abstract thinking and being able to generalize. 
and generalizing is abstract. So this there's abstract thinking that's taking place in terms of generalization throughout childhood. But he's talking about understanding your own thinking processes so that you can begin to control that. And that's a level of abstract thinking that you can't have if your thinking is still thinking with complexes. So it's always important to, there's no the process that it's, that it just all of a sudden become, it's a process of development. It has the seeds, but its manifestation may be, in its true essence, may be down the, the road. So, again, with worldview, I'll let you read this, and then we're, we're almost finished here. And the key part of that is at the end there, a method of relating to the world that a child has. How different is that from the world view? It's interacting with the world, and through those interactions, seeing what's good, what's bad, what works, what doesn't, that is their activity in the world, and the feedback from the activity in the world that is their world view. And again, if we, we look at this, it's in the context, this activity is in this whole context. So next time, we're going to actually do video 11. Sorry if there was some confusion. And it's really sort of wrapping up everything. And I want to just very quickly go through two slides I didn't get to last time. And um, um, for a long, for a long, for a, um, brought this up in a question. And that is the zone of proximal development with some with an artifact, with, with a book, for example. What's the relationship there? Because you know, is there a zone of proximal understanding there? And I would argue very strongly, yes, that the, again, if the book is too complex, like Bukowski, <laughs> then it's difficult that there's a big zone of practical understanding. And I'm just beginning to navigate that big zone myself. So the, that has to be matched with the individual conceptual understanding. So when we give reading out to students, we have to take this very much in mind, but we don't. We assign the same book to every single student, and usually it's dictated by some board someplace that thinks that you should read Dickens in 10th grade or in books. Even, even the uh, one was scout and the, to kill a monkey. Yeah, to, to kill a monkey. It's difficult to start reading that when my daughter. That language. Is, so it's very important that we keep in mind this whole concept of conceptual uh, understanding when we choose our reading. And this is something that, that Lindsay brought up the constitutional characteristics of the person. And, Generally, the personal characteristics of children are mobilized by a parish of Anya, are laid down, become crystallized within a given parish of Anya. And she asked about the word crystallized. And I asked Natalia to look in the, the Russian. And what, because I forget the metaphor you were using, whether it's like a diamond to cut or it's firm or, you know, but in the Russian, it's it means clear. 
crystal clear. And so you can see this translation here, how that concept doesn't really come up. Come up. Speak up. Evident, yeah, yeah. So um, we will stop here and um, Cuernavaca, if uh, you want to to come come in and we can see if there's some Q and A and people want to go back to Zoom um, or if you've got other things that need to do, you can uh, do that. But we'll be in touch. Yeah. Okay, so this is the time to get up and get some snacks here. <laughs> Entonces, eh, vamos a dejar la, la sesión hasta acá. ¿no? Eh, y bueno, pues ya este, nos recuperaremos en la, en la siguiente. Pues terminaríamos por hoy. Y pues ya nada más mandaría un mensaje por correo.
Bueno, fue un poco la respuesta como que abordó. Sí, como que va pasando. 